Don't just show the inside, because that's really what, yeah, the information. some to give out so they can pick their own. Okay.
Good evening. I'd like to call the Durham City Council meeting to order. Uh, on Monday, May the 5th at 7.03 p.m., and certainly want to welcome all of you that are in attendance. Uh, if we could just take a moment for silent meditation, please. Thank you. I would ask Councilman Brown if he would lead us in the pledge. Madam Clerk, will you call the roll, please? Mayor Bell. Present. Mayor Pro Tem Cole McFadden. Councilmember Brown. Councilmember Katati. Councilmember Davis. Councilmember Moffitt. And Councilmember Shul. Uh, we have several proclamations that we'd like to present this evening. Uh, the first is Children's Mental Health Awareness Week. Uh, Ms. Tika Dempton, available. If you join us, please. The proclamation reads, whereas all our children, without regard to challenges they face, a valuable and a significant part of the rich and diverse resources of our present and our future, whereas all children under ages 0 to 26 deserve to be supported as they struggle with serious mental health and behavioral challenges, where support for our youth as they grow and develop from cradle to career is essential to the success of children, families, and the community, whereas mental health is essential to overall health and well-being, whereas according to the United States Department of Health and Human Services, one in five children has a mental health disorder, and one in 10 adolescents aged nine through 17 have a serious mental illness, Whereas with proper treatment and support, children with mental health disorders can succeed in all life domains and reach their full potential, moving from cradle to career. Whereas parents, doctors, and nurses, teachers, guidance counselors, neighbors, friends, concerned citizens, and faith-based communities, among the men who may reach out to children, youth, and their families in our community, who are in need of support, education, information, encouragement, and mental health resources. Whereas community members can help establish safe and supportive communities that encourage and engage all young people, regardless of their challenges, to reach their full potential, where strong youth and young adults will strive to positively change the misconceptions about youth with mental illnesses, diagnosis to a vision of strong and capable young people who can overcome challenges, and whereas the city of Durham joins the Durham Center becoming and other community organizations in recognizing the need to raise awareness among our children and mental health, commending those who work to support our youth and celebrating those children with mental health disorders who reach their full potential. Now, therefore, I, William Bill Bell, Mayor of the City of Durham, North Carolina, do hereby proclaim the week of May 5 through 11, 2014, as Children's Mental Health Awareness Week in Durham, and hereby call upon the citizens, government agencies, public and private institutions, businesses, and schools in Durham County to commit to an increase in our community's awareness and understanding of the issues of mental health among our children and youth. And with my hand, Corpus Hill, City of Durham, North Carolina, this is the fifth day of May, 2014. And I would like to present this. Thank you for any comments you might have. Thank you. On behalf of what um, I usually call those who may not have a voice or the ability to share their voice, I say thank you. Mental health is truly being made aware of. People are becoming extremely educated um, about mental health, and that's only happening because of a proclamation that the city has chosen to really endorse. So when you think of good things are happening in Durham, think about our young people with, who's living with mental health life challenges, who's finishing school, who's preparing themselves for jobs, becoming parents, active in their community. So the proclamation that you've endorsed is not just a piece of paper, it's an actual living document that is being utilized throughout Durham. And tonight, I'm very happy to have just a couple of our youth and our workforce 
coordinator and if you just stand and say hi and I have to say that because usually I'm by myself so this evening is really great so you can see people who are um, benefiting from the proclamation so thank you very much I should have recognized Tika as the lead family partner coordinators of Alliance Behavioral Healthcare. Next, I would ask uh, Mike Evans, president of the Durham County Fraternal Order of Police Lodge, number two, to join me, please. How you doing? Uh, this recognizes Police Week, where as a Congress and President of the United States, have designated May 15th as Peace Officers Memorial Day and the week in which it falls as National Police Week, whereas officers of the Durham's law enforcement agencies play an essential role safeguarding the rights and freedom of the citizens of Durham, where it is important that our citizens are aware of and understand the dangers and problems encountered and the duties and responsibilities incurred by the law enforcement officers, whereas it is equally important that our law enforcement officers recognize their duties to serve the people by safeguarding life and property protecting them from violence or disorder, and by protecting the innocent against deception and the weak against oppression or intimidation, whereas the men and women of Durham's law enforcement agencies unceasingly provide a vital public service. Now, therefore, I, William E. Bill Bell, Mayor of the City of Durham, North Carolina, do hereby proclaim the week of May 11 through 17, 2014, as Police Week, and May 2, 2014, as Peace Officers Memorial Day in Durham, and call upon our citizens to join in commemorating law enforcement officers, past and present, who have rendered a dedicated service to their community. I encourage our citizens to attend, and this was held at, on May the 2nd at Raystone Baptist Church, and I had an opportunity to go in. I had to leave, but I understand it was a great program. Uh, to honor those peace officers who have lost their lives or who have become disabled in the line of duty, we also extend our gratitude to Durham County Fraternal Order of Police Lodge Number 2, for coordinating and hosting this annual memorial service observance. And with this my hand, Corporate Silver City of Durham, North Carolina, this is the fifth day of May, 2014. I'd like to present this to you for any comments that you may have. On behalf of Lodge Number Two, FOP, and all law enforcement officers in Durham and the County of Durham, thank you very much. I'd like to ask Kevin Dick, the Director of Office of Economic Development, Workforce Development, to join me, please. Uh, this proclamation recognizes Workforce Development Professional Month, and whereas the economic development of every region in our country and the ability of our businesses and industries to compete in the global economy is more than ever before dependent on the availability and quality of a skilled workforce, whereas the complexity and fast-paced change in our economy and labor markets puts new demands on individuals employers at all levels, whereas job seekers need the assistance of knowledgeable and dedicated professionals to facilitate the process by which our workforce identifies, prepares for, obtains, and maintains employment and self-sufficiency, whereas employers depend on similar levels of professional services to help them recruit and retain a competitive workforce and to con continually upgrade the skill sets of their incumbent employees. Now, therefore, I, William Bill Bell, Bell, Mayor of the City of Durham, North Carolina, I do have a proclaim May 20th. To May 2014 as Workforce Development Professionals Month in Durham, and hereby urge all citizens to take special note of this observance, honor all those individuals and all the workforce development organizations and partnerships who play such a vital role in our economy. Again, witness my hand, Corpus Hill City of Durham, North Carolina, this is the fifth day of May 2014. I'd like to present this to Kevin for any comments he might have. <coughs> Mr. Mayor, uh, council members, administration, Durham businesses and residents, uh, I'm very pleased this evening to have the opportunity to accept this proclamation on behalf of all of the hardworking individuals that represent the workforce development system in Durham. I'd like, them, I'd like to ask them to stand, uh, those who can make it tonight and remain standing, please. These individuals work uh, under the policy direction of the Durham Workforce Development Board, which includes individuals such as Mayor Pro Tem, Cora Cole McFadden, Councilman Shul, and we thank you all for your, your timeless uh, energy and, and devotion to the effort. 
This group, under the direction of the board, stands re poised and ready to lead a workforce development system that basically can uh, accomplish all of the, the uh, things that were articulated in the mayor's proclamation. And they intend to do that through opportunities such as the Durham Youth Work Internship Program, recruitment events, hot jobs listings, as well as on-the-job training grants that are available for Durham businesses who wish to hire uh, qualified Durham job seekers. And so we thank you again this evening for this opportunity, and we will work hard to make sure this workforce development system can deliver uh, the needs of business and also provide more opportunities to Durham job seekers. Thanks very much. Well, it's Councilman Don Moffitt, if he would join me, please. Uh, we have two presentations this evening. The first is National Drinking Water Week Proclamation. Uh, it's Brian Anderson, Laboratory Analysis for the Water Supply and Treatment Division of Department of Water Management. Is Vicky around? Oh, okay, good. <laughs> Who is this? Okay, Wayne. Okay, Wayne. Wayne. Green drops. I got you. All right. I, mean, I shook his hand coming down. I should have known. Uh, whereas water is a basic and essential need of mankind, and whereas our health, comfort, and standard of living depend upon an adequate supply of safe, clean water, whereas throughout the years the city of Durham has taken a lead role in source water management and protection, as well as the production of a consistent supply of high quality drinking water, whereas the southeast portion of the United States, the state of North Carolina, the region in Durham specifically have weathered two historic droughts in the last 12 years, whereas changing climate and global warming, warming may impact the availability of our precious natural resources, whereas our drinking water and water resources are undervalued, whereas dedicated individuals and organizations such as city employees, industry leaders, scientists, environmentalists, and students have made significant contributions in developing, operating, and maintaining these systems, protecting and conserving this precious resource and educating the public on the value of this resource. Now, therefore, I, William B. Bill Bell, Mayor of the City of Durham, North Carolina, do have our proclaim May 4th through May 10th, 2014, as National Drinking Water Week in the City of Durham, in conjunction with National Drinking Water Month, which is May 1st through May 31st, 2014, and urge all citizens to join me as a partner in the Water Use It Wisely campaign, and to pledge to embrace a water conservation ethic to extend the life of our most precious natural resource. Again, with my hand, Corporate Silver City of Durham, North Carolina. This is the fifth day of May 2014, and I'm going to present this to Brian for any comments that he might have. Thank you, Mayor Bell. Uh, I'm honored to accept this proclamation on behalf of the Water Supply and Treatment Division and more than 300 employees of the Department of Water Management. As a lab analyst, I work with my colleagues to ensure that whenever the citizens of Durham turn on their tap, clean, safe, and high quality water flows out. This requires teamwork among our certified water treatment plant and distribution system operators and behind the scenes work by lab analysts, chemists, con conservation staff, engineers, and manager who are all committed to protecting and preserving this precious natural resource well into the future. We thank you for recognizing the vital role that safe w drinking water plays in our lives, and we appreciate support of city council, city administration, citizens, and the employees of other city departments. Thank you. time we're going to be pleased to um, recognize our poster contest winners. This year we received 342 posters from 11 participating schools, so we definitely want to thank all the teachers and the students who participated. Um, in our kindergarten through second, in our kindergarten through second grade category, the first place winner was Sam Slowick, second grade Trinity School of Durham in Chapel Hill.
Okay. Second place winner is Parker Zubek, Trinity School of Durham in Chapel Hill, second place. And that was second place. Third place is Sam Ekstrand, Immaculata Catholic School. Okay, in the third through fifth grade category, Okay, third through fifth grade category, Kaylee DeArmy, first place. And that was, oh, she wasn't, that's right. Second place, Mukta Dharmapurikar, Durham Academy. Okay. In our sixth through eighth grade division, First place, Naomi Pridgen, Trinity School of Durham and Chapel Hill. Second place goes to Jasmine Castillo, Shepherd Magnet Middle School. And honorable mention, Jacqueline McVeigh. Voyager Academy. Okay, and now to recognize our state winners in the kindergarten through second grade category. Parker Zubek, second place. Third place, Sam Slowick. Grades three through five, first place in the state was Josephine Wilson. And she's not here. Uh, grades three through five, second place in the state, Mukta Dharma Purikar. For first place in the state, Jacqueline McVeigh. That was in sixth through eighth grade category.
I'd like to ask um, Rhonda Parker, Director of Park, Durham Parks and Recreation, and Bridget Robinson, Recreation Assistant Supervisor for Mature Adult Programming for Durham Parks and Recreation, to join me. This proclamation is for Bill Bell, who's 73 years old. <laughs> <laughs> okay, not today in January, but I'll take that anyway. Uh, whereas the city of Durham includes 31,000 residents, ages 60 and older, whereas the city of Durham is committed to helping all individuals live longer, healthier lives, whereas old adults in the city of Durham have made countless contributions and sacrifices to ensure a better life for future generations, whereas we recognize the value of injury prevention and safety awareness in helping older adults remain healthy and active, and are working to provide safety, education, and injury and loss prevention, whereas our community can provide opportunities to enrich the lives of individuals, young and old, by one, emphasizing the need to take action to safeguard themselves from unintentional injuries where they live, work, and socialize, two, by providing information on avoiding leading causes of injury for older adults, falls, motor vehicles related incidents, suffocation, medication, overdose, and fire burns, and three, helping older adults take control of their safety and well-being. Now, therefore, I, William B. Bill Bell, Mayor of the City of Durham, North Carolina, do hereby proclaim the month of May as Older Americans Month in the City of Durham and urge all residents to take special note of this observance by recognizing the Durham Parks and Recreation Department for their commitment and dedication to the older Americans living in our community, for their planning of the many events commemorating May as Older Americans Month, and witness by hand, Corporate Silver City of Durham, North Carolina, this is the fifth day of May 2014. And I'll present this to Rhonda and her staff. Thank you, Mayor Bell, City Council, City Manager, residents of Durham, and colleagues. I want to thank you for this recognition because May uh, is Older Americans Month. and. I'm a mature adult too, so I'm proud of that. But I would like to introduce Sarah Hogan, who is our manager over special programs, mature adults and inclusion. And we also have Bridget Robinson here. Thank you. Thank you, Rhonda, mayor and council. Um, we are glad to have our newest member of our mature adult team with me tonight, Bridget Robinson. And I promised her she wouldn't have to speak if she would just come with me. So Bridget is standing here behind me. Um, this is a very exciting month. We've just completed our Durham Senior Games program, and it's a great time for me to bra brag a little bit about what we've been able to accomplish as a city. Uh, this year we had 167 athletes, which is up slightly from previous year. Um, we've doubled the number of silver art performers we had. We had six actually performing this year um, in our silver arts competition and exhibits. We had over 50 pieces of artwork, and that's literary art, heritage art, um, fine arts, paintings, drawings, poetry, short stories, um, woodworking, crochet, just showing off talents of our persons 55 and better. And that exhibition was at the Arts Council, so we've tried to make sure that we're having our artists exhibited throughout our community. We also added cycling this year, and in the past we've done our Durham Senior Games cycling in collaboration with Wake County, and this year we uh, created a relationship with the School of Creative Studies, which was the Tuning Middle School, and we uh, had our cycling competition this past Saturday. And even though it was a little bit small, it was a mighty group, so we were real excited about that. Many of you may remember uh, last January and February, we got a grant from NCRPA for arthritis walking. And so we held that program, had over 50 uh, mature adults who participated in walking. And we'll be doing that again this fall. So we're going to take the summer off and get cranked back up in the fall. If you know someone who has arthritis or um, some type of joint disease or, or uh, disease process that, that they need some exercise and walking. We'll have that starting again in September. And in the summer, we have our pork festival trip. It's on the 11th of June. We have a Spirit of Norfolk trip on the 16th of July. We're going to Cherokee and Asheville in August. We've got fishing outings, dining around Durham, movie outings to Northgate Cinema, arthritis exercise, chair exercise, open gym for persons who don't want to play with the 20-year-olds, you can come and play with those of us who are 55 and better, gospel movement, and, and many, many more. 
Um, I was at a presentation with our city's leadership uh, group recently where the fire department and police department were talking about doing some collaboration on mature adult safety. And so we began also speaking with those two departments about trying to offer those opportunities to the seniors at our recreation centers. Um, this, this year's Older American Month um, emphasis is on safe today and healthy tomorrow. And so as we age and try to encourage ourselves to remain healthy, the Parks and Recreation Department is eager to be part of that driving safety today and healthy tomorrow. Thank you all very much. And there is information in the back. If you'd like to know about our mature adult trips and other programs, please pick some of that information up or be happy to call Bridget or myself. We'd we'll, we'll be glad to speak with you. Thanks so much. I ask Councilman Shule if he would uh, take over the podium, please. This last item. Thank you very much, Mr. Mayor. Uh, I would like to ask the members of the Fitzgerald family and those who are here with them to please come up. Good to see you all here. This is a proclamation honoring Robert George Fitzgerald. Robert, whereas Robert Fitzgerald, along with his father Thomas and his brothers Richard and William, served as laborers in support of the Union during the early years of the Civil War and was wounded in the eye during this time by a Confederate sniper. And Robert, whereas Robert Fitzgerald, bolstered by the Emancipation Proclamation, enlisted in the Union Navy in 1863 and served aboard the William G. Anderson and then, after leaving the Navy for medical reasons, joined the 5th Massachusetts Cavalry of the Union Army in 1864. And whereas Robert Fitzgerald fought at the Battle of Petersburg and served with approximately 200,000 other African-American soldiers and sailors whose efforts were crucial to the United States victory in 1865, and whereas Robert Fitzgerald, seeing himself as a soldier in a second war, this time against ignorance, made it his mission to be an educator and political activist in support of newly freed African Americans in Orange County, North Carolina in 1869 as part of the federal program of reconstruction. And whereas Robert Fitzgerald started a brick making business with his brother Richard while continuing to teach at the school he founded and later in the early 1870s moved to Durham to pursue both economic and educational opportunities. And whereas Robert Fitzgerald and his brother Richard Fitzgerald, despite harsh racial discrimination, became leading brickmakers in Durham, where Richard was able to expand his business to real estate and banking to become one of the first wealthy black businessmen in Durham. And whereas Robert Fitzgerald married his wife Cornelia Smith of Chapel Hill in, in 1869 and had four daughters who lived into adulthood and then retired from his brickyard business after losing his eyesight due to the injury he experienced during the war, and whereas Robert Fitzgerald continued teaching in Durham's West End community despite his war injuries and built a home for his family circa 1898 on what was then known as Cameron Street and is now 906 Carroll Street. And whereas Robert and Cornelia Fitzgerald helped raise their, their granddaughter, Polly Murray, and inspired her through their example to fight for human rights as an educator, activist, and later first African-American woman to be ordained an Episcopal priest. And whereas Robert Fitzgerald died in 1919 and was buried in the Fitzgerald family plot on Kent Street, now a part of Maplewood Cemetery where his granddaughter, Polly Murray, defiantly planted the Union flag on Memorial Day to claim her heritage. And whereas, Robert Fitzgerald's family, family home is now slated to become an historic site and the future home of the Polly Murray Center for History and Social Justice. Now therefore, I, William V. Bill Bear, Bell, Mayor, Mayor of the City of Durham, North Carolina, do hereby proclaim May 26, 2014 is Fitzgerald Family Day in Durham, and hereby urge all citizens to spe take special note of Robert Fitzgerald's contributions and to attend programs in his honor being planned by the Fitzgerald family and the Polly Murray Project. Witness my hand the corporate seal of the city of Durham, North Carolina, this fifth day of May, 2014. And now I'm gonna ask uh, Barbara Lau, uh, Courtney, okay. Uh, Courtney Reed Eaton is gonna uh, 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 talk to us a little bit and uh, introduce the uh, people who are here with her. Thank you. 
Thank you, Councilman Shule and Mr. Mayor Bell and other council people. Um, on behalf of the Fitzgerald family and the Pauli Murray Project, we're very grateful and excited about this. And I would like to introduce Stephanie Davis, who's a cousin of Pauli Murray's and a member of the Fitzgerald family. All right. <laughs> and I want to introduce Barbara Lau. She's the head of the Pauli Murray Project. And Phil Rubio, he helped us start our celebration at the memorial at the Fitzgerald Family Cemetery on Memorial Day. And on behalf of the Fitzgerald family and the Pauli Murray Project, We'd like to invite you to please join us at the historic Fitzgerald Family Cemetery on Memorial Day. It's Monday, May 26th from 10 to 12 noon. It's free and open to everyone. Come and join us at Maplewood Cemetery on Kent Street, and then join us at the historic Robert Fitzgerald Pauli Murray House on Carroll Street. Thank you. Thank you, as uh, Steve comes back to the dais, are there comments by members of the council? Recognize Councilman Brown. I didn't, I didn't see the mayor pro tem. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I must say, in, in the uh, Sunday, Darrell Morning Herald, uh, there was a rather uh, rare and refreshing letter to the editor written by Carolyn Lunda. And it was entitled, Thanks to Government Workers. Thanks to government workers. And in that letter, she reminded us that uh, May 4 through May 10 is Public Service Recognition Week. And she, won't, she went on to uh, thank the, the members of various federal agencies including the Center for Disease Control, the Environmental Health Services, EPA, which is located in Research Triangle Park, members, workers within the Social Security Administration, the U.S. Postal Service, the air traffic controllers, and of course, those serving in our armed forces. It, um, this letter, believe it or not, could be viewed by some as rather controversial. Even though these are our citizens who go to work every day to serve their constituents and their citizens. Uh, unfortunately, it would be viewed as controversial because of the sad and sour atmosphere that uh, now seems to pervade those government workers at both the federal or state and local levels. And too often, in my judgment, uh, they are condemned and maligned and criticized especially, too, by a group that enjoys drinking tea and enjoys partying. <laughs> now, none of us are naive about public workers. You know, they are not perfect. But again, particularly here at the local level, they serve us in a variety of capacities, some of which we've heard about this, about this evening. 
uh, and we'll hear further on. Uh, officers from our police department who patrol our, our streets, those who, who work in general services and public works, maintaining our buildings and our street, sanitation workers who collect our garbage, our legal team who hopefully will keep us out of court, the water department as we heard this evening who works to ensure that whenever we turn on our tap in our homes that that water is clean and safe and pure. Now I could go on and, and on, but let me cite from, again, Carolyn London's letter that, quote, we may not fully realize all that America's public servants do for us on a daily basis. And above all, let us not take for granted the many services they provide. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Eugene, that was very, very appropriate. Thank you, appreciate that. Recognize the Mayor Pro Tem. Uh, just as a follow-up of what uh, Councilman uh, Brown has said, last year I think we proclaimed a week as City Employee Recognition Week. So I think we probably need to do that again. And I'll try to find the proclamation from last year. But you're absolutely right. Oh, I wanted to just congratulate Mount Level Baptist Church on 150 years, 150 years uh, in uh, this county. Uh, many of us attended the service yesterday, which was very inspirational. But that is certainly uh, a real milestone for a religious institution. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Mr. Perdue. Under the leadership, I'm sorry, of Dr. William Turner. Thanks. He hasn't been there 150 years, but <laughs> he is holding it together now. <laughs> I, I want to uh, remind persons about an announcement concerning the South Side Forum that will be tomorrow night on WNCU 90.7 Central. Uh, radio station. Uh, it's an opportunity for interested residents to learn more about living at the newly transformed Southside neighborhood. Uh, new residents, city staff, and builders will be there to answer questions about rental and home ownership in this community. Uh, again, the forum will air, air tomorrow, Tuesday, May 6th, from 7 o'clock to 8 o'clock to answer any questions that uh, persons might have about living there. And the guests will include Southside residents, uh, city staff, the rental leasing agent, and the home builders. Uh, Southside is a major investment by the city of Durham. It has been transformed with more than 130 new rental units. They aren't complete yet. They're in the process of being completed. And 48 single family homes that are affordable for many income levels. And for them, some of you who may not know, recognize the name Southside, this is the old Rolling Hills site on Lakewood and uh, Roxborough and South Side are some homes that are being built on the South, uh, South Street area. Uh, questions uh, should have been submitted by email to uh, kpierce at nccu.edu and they could have been submitted at that point or either through the radio telephone number 919-530-7833. Uh, the cutoff date for that was the 2nd of May. But if you want information, you can contact the city's community development department, and that number is 919-560-4570, or you can go to the city's website. And it's being hosted by our illustrious, what's the title I'm going to give you? <laughs> Beverly Thompson. <laughs> director of Public Affairs. I call her many good things, but she's the Director of Public Affairs for the city of Durham and she's hosting that that event okay let's move on and uh, recognize councilwoman Katani thank you mayor I just wanted to remind everyone to please go out and vote tomorrow polls are open from approximately 7 to 7 
Thank you. 6.30 to 7.30. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Uh, I would entertain prior items by the city manager. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Good evening, everyone. Uh, two priority items this evening. Uh, agenda item number seven, which is the award of home funds to community alternatives for support of abodes for permanent affordable housing. Uh, the, uh, this item we would uh, request you wait and approve after the public hearing, which is item number uh, 26. And then agenda item number 31, the 2014 first quarter uh, summary of public safety report has been added as a supplemental item to the agenda. Presentation from the chief. I'm taking a motion, Marty. It's been proper move and second. Mayor Probe, you have a question? I, I had some additional questions about item six. Didn't want to move it, just wanted uh, to pull it. Just wanted to know if the manager had an opportunity to follow up on any of the questions relative to how we would assure that um, the young people that we serve actually are Durham County residents uh, in this uh, agreement. So noted, thank you. I, mean, I don't have the answer right now, Mayor Tim. It is something that we've asked about, but I'm not prepared to uh, respond to that this evening. Any further questions? If not, call the question. Madam Clerk, will you open the vote? Close the vote. It passes 7 to 0. I recognize the city attorney for any priority items. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. No priority items. Likewise, the city clerk. No items, Mr. Mayor. Uh, we'll proceed with the agenda. First part of the agenda are the, is a consent agenda. A consent agenda item may be approved with a single vote uh, by the council. If an item is pulled by a council member or a person from the audience, we discuss that item later in the program. And again, I'll just read the heading of each one of the consent agenda items. Item one is approval of city council minutes. Item two is the Durham Convention and Visitors Bureau Tourism Development Authority appointment. Item four is street and infrastructure acceptances. Item six is the memorandum of agreement connecting youth. Item seven, award of home funds. And we've asked that to be heard after we have the supplemental item. Item eight is bid report February 2014. Item nine is bid report March 2014. Item 11 is city of Durham swimming pool facilities assessment study professional services contract with Saska Design Inc. Item 12 is Lee Farm Park Design Contract Amendment Number 4, Hagel Smith Design PA. Item 14 is 400 Cleveland Street Roof and Envelope Renovations Contract with L.A. Downing and Sons, Inc. Item 15 is Amendment Number 2 to Professional Services Agreement by Design for Fire Station 9 and Amendment Number 2 to the Contract for Special Inspections and Construction Materials Testing Services for the Fire Station 9 Project. Item 16 is a resolution supporting affordable housing around transit stations and neighborhood transit centers. <coughs> Item 17 is waterline utility agreement with North Carolina Department of Transportation for the Main Street Bridge replacement. Item 18 is Hillendale dual water replacement, phase two reimbursement to North Carolina Department of Transportation. Item 19 is contract amendment for sidewalk repairs and curb ramps. Item 20 is license agreement with Church and Main Associates LLC for balconies at East Main Street. Item 21 is amendment number two to the contract between the city of Durham and King Management NC LLC, formerly King and Martin Properties LLC, for management of the city owned yard waste and compost facility. Item 22 is an update of comprehensive housing strategy, five year funding plan and dedicated funding source. Item 23 is a resolution to support the Upper Noose River Basin Association for the reexamination of the Fall Lake, Falls Lake Stage 2 goals that the UNRBA adopted FY 2015 funding level. Uh, I accept uh, for the consent agenda items with the exception of item 7. Entertain a motion for that. Uh, it's been proper move and second. Madam Clerk, we open the vote. Close the vote. It passes seven to zero. Uh, we move to the general business agenda, public hearings. 
Item 25 is hearing on the draft FY 2014-2015 annual action plan for the use of community development block grant home investment partnerships program and emergency solutions grant funds. Recognize Reginald Johnson, Director of Community Development. Mayor Bell, members of the City Council, Reginald Johnson, Director of the Community Development Department. This is a public hearing on the uh, annual action plan. I will share, I will uh, turn it over to Ms. Wilma Conyers, Federal Programs Coordinator, Coordinator for the Particulars. I would uh, share with the Council that as has been our practice with the annual action plan, any uh, items that are approved in the plan will come back before the Council as, uh, as appropriate, at the appropriate time. This is a public hearing. You've heard the uh, introduction of it, and we'll hear from the staff on the plan itself. Good evening, Mayor Bell and members of Council, Wilmer Conyers, Federal Programs Coordinator. The purpose of this public hearing is to receive citizen comments on the draft 1415 annual action plan concerning the use of community development block grant funds, home investment partnership funds, and emergency solution grant funds. Notice of this meeting was advertised in the Herald Sun, distributed via general list served, and posted on the Department of Community Development's website on April 4th and advertised in the Carolina Times on April 5th. The draft annual action plan was made available for public review beginning April 4th through May 5th, 2014 at the Department of Community Development and on its website at the Durham County Public Main Library, at the City and County Clerk's offices, at the front desk of City Hall, and distributed via a general listserv. As a HUD requirement, the City is required to hold at least two public hearings prior to the submission of the annual action plan. The first meeting was held on January 6, 2014, to receive citizen comments on needs of the community. According to the final entitlement allocations published by HUD on March 18, 2014, the city expects to receive $1,795,508 in CDBG funds, $831,909 in home funds, and $147,000 $357 in ESG funds. Comments from this public hearing and written comments received from citizens during the development of this plan will be incorporated into the final annual action plan. Later tonight on the agenda, we request council approval on the draft FY 2014-2015 annual action plan for submission to HUD. The annual action plan is required to be submitted to HUD by May 15th. Thank you. Let me first ask from the council, are there any questions? This is a public hearing. We have persons that have signed up to speak. I have five persons, six persons that have signed up to speak. Let me ask, is there anyone else that would like to speak on this item? This being a public hearing that has not signed up. One, if you could uh, go to the clerk's table and get your, is there anyone else that would like to speak? If not, uh, as I call your name, if you proceed to the podium to my right, uh, each speaker has three minutes. There's a time clock in front of you. And I state your name again and address when you come before us. Uh, the first is Joy Stepney, followed by Tara Glasper, followed by Cynthia Harris, followed by Damar Glasper, followed by Selena Mack, and followed by Shamika Reinhardt. Uh, again. Joy Stepney, 2603 Chapel Hill Road, Durham, North Carolina. Good evening. Again, my name is Joy Stepney and I'm Assistant Director at Housing for New Hope. Today I'm here to encourage you, the City Council, to accept the ESG and Dedicated Housing Fund recommendations as presented by the Department of Community Development. This evening, we will hear from the program staff that work directly with our families and have the honor to hear from some of the actual individuals who participated in the Rapid Rehousing Program. This is not just about touching stories. It is about a program that has had successful outcomes since 2009. 
Since the beginning of Housing for New Hope's Rackery Housing Program, our goals have ranged from 80 to 140 households per year. Because of the strong relationships and hard work of our staff and the people we serve, we have met or exceeded our goals annually. Over the past year with your funding and from private sources, we have, <laughs> we have provided 36 households with housing. From the beginning, we've served and actually housed a total of 266 households since its inception. This figure does not include the 42 households that we housed during the Lincoln apartment crisis. But realize this is not just about our agency. Housing for New Hope can only fund or can only help individuals through collaboration. Our partners such as Genesis Home, Urban Ministries of Durham, the Department of Social Services, Durham Interface Hospitality Network, and Healing with Care. I say all this to say that Housing for New Hope Housing for New Hope's rapid rehousing program does need funding to continue, but it's bigger than just that. This is a community effort, and it's not just about our agency. It's about the homeless community and our fellow providers. Next, you'll be hearing from the rapid rehousing team leader, Cynthia Harris. Good evening. I'm Cynthia Harris, and I live at 4659 Hope Valley Road, Durham, North Carolina. The purpose of the rehousing program is to assist individuals who are homeless with finding permanent housing. The criteria for the program is that they must be literally homeless, meaning not staying with someone, maybe living in a car, a shelter, abandoned building, a hotel with um, assistance from an agency. That's considered literally homeless and they must meet the income guidelines. The process is that the clients are referred to us from our partnering agencies like the Urban Ministries, Department of Social Services, Durham Public Schools refer people to us, mental health agencies, pastors. They um, refer our clients to us. We do the intake procedure, we approve them for housing, and it is our goal to house our clients within 30 days. There have been times when, we, when we've housed people within two weeks. Um, we offer them financial assistance, such as security deposits, two to three months of rental assistance. Some people may get a little bit more depending on their needs. Um, we offer assistance with utilities and ongoing case management. Some of the challenges that our clients face is that they have um, poor rental history. They may have low income, underemployment, and they may have some criminal things going on. And those are barriers to them getting into housing. But the good thing is we have a strong network of landlords that we work with. And uh, they tend to really approve our consumers for housing. We, um, reason our network is so strong is because we do what we say we're going to do. We just don't put our clients there and leave them. We continue to work with them and we're there for them um, if there's a problem with the landlord, if the landlord has a problem with them, we respond immediately. Uh, the other thing is we have taught our clients how to be responsible renters. We do ready to rent classes, which teach them about reading the lease. Um, what is expected of your landlord? What do, you, what do the landlord expect of you? And we do intense budgeting with them. We have um, bi-weekly case management meetings and the focus is to, main, to um, focus on maintaining housing and at that time we look at their check stubs to see what they're bringing in and we look at um, the bills that they're paying to make sure that they're paying them. Uh, tonight I have some of our consumers with us, with us and I would like for you to see the people, some of the people that we have housed over this past year. We've housed nurses, housekeepers, cooks, we've housed Durham public employees, we've housed teachers. So um, would you guys please stand up, our clients please, that we have housed this year? Give you an idea of what we've, we've housed. Thank you very much. And now I'd like for you to hear from one of our families, the Glasper family. Thank you. Hello, my name is Tara Glasper, and I stay at 609 Bacon Street. I was born in Durham, North Carolina, and I'm an um, instructional assistant at Merritt Moore. Well, I was homeless for about a year, and it has been hard, and if it hadn't have been for um, Housing for New Hope, I don't know what my family would have done, because my husband had lost his job for um, a little over a year to two years. 
and it had been hard on us and I think housing for new hope and basically um, it was hard on basically my husband which is a he's a veteran and basically when my husband went for help for the VA he didn't get any help at, at the VA they sent us to all different avenues to get help other ways they didn't help us they sent us other ways and then I had a 21 year old daughter and they didn't 20 year old daughter they didn't want to they wanted to send her other separate us so I'm gonna let my son come and um, tell his side of his story hello so my name is DeMar Glasper and I go to Hillside High School and I'm a sophomore. And um, pretty much what happened, I guess I should. Could you get the microphone for him? Thank you. I guess I should start from the beginning. So as of like January 18th of last year, I remember my parents, they've always been straightforward with me and my sister and just an open book. So as of January 18th of last year, that's when they, um, they sat us down called us out of our rooms and they sat us down and told us that we were being evicted and me and my sister we didn't really know what to do and that's when like all the different questions started coming like how did this happen what can we do and that's when I started looking into just being me and being curious and just looking into different things like different apartment complexes and stuff and then that's when my parents explained to me and like Miss Cynthia said that it's due to like past rental history and things like that and obviously we had just been evicted so they probably wouldn't have helped us or accepted us so and then that's when from there I took off school from uh, like the day that we had to be out which was 10 days later the 28th of January and that day I was all about me and my dad we were just all about moving everything that we could out of the house and that day we had to that day we had to leave like most of our stuff behind because we had like a car and we didn't we couldn't we didn't have money to get a truck or anything so and luckily housing for new help hope helped us after like six and 12 months of us staying with someone else Can you tell us else? we have two that's, seconds that's my set time. oh <laughs> sorry <laughs> oh and I, I was thinking that was short on time i'm sorry so and that's when we went to go and stay with my grandmother. And after staying with my grandmother for a while, that was, oh, am I out of time? Go ahead and finish it. Oh, so after staying with my grandmother from like February until like November, it was hard because you know, I was used to having my own space and we were all used to having our own space. And then that's when me and my mother and my sister and my dad, we had to split up and my parents, they went to go and stay inside of the car, and me and my sister, we were split up. We weren't even in the same house. She went to go and stay with my aunt, and I went to go and stay with my cousin. And when we were staying separately, that's when uh, my cousin, she was trying to put bad things inside of my head. And it was just a whole bunch of just shenanigans, and they were trying to tell me that my parents weren't fit parents for me, and that they were trying to abandon me, and then that's when, like, a month had gone by and my parents they sat us down and told us that we had been helped by um housing for new help and me and my sister we were thrilled so yeah thank you thank you just want to say that Durham Community Land Trustees houses quite a few housing for new hope residents too and it's been a really good working relationship with them but I'm here on another matter actually um, I'm here about the DCLC's request for funding we, for we, we know you but it's oh fine. yes I'm sorry <laughs> my name is my name is Selena Mack I'm the executive director of Durham Community Land Trustees 1208 West Chapel Hill Street Durham North Carolina mm -hmm. 27701 um, so tonight I'm here about DCLT's request for funding for fiscal year 2014-2015 our request this year is primarily focused on the preservation of existing affordable housing stock. This thing feels like it's tagging me. Um, we are, um, among our requests is a request for $300,000 in repairs for our West Park and Moorhead Glen apartment units. 
These 30 units were developed in 1993 and 1995 as low-income housing tax credit pro pro properties. After its compliance period, Durham Community Land Trustees took over sole ownership in 2011 to ensure their long-term affordability. After nearly 20 years, these units are in need of major capital improvements to remain a good safe rental in good safe rental condition and to improve their energy efficiency. Planned improvements include parking lot repairs, roof replacements, window replacement, HVAC and hot water heater replacements, and where necessary the replacement of cabinets, flooring, doors and appliances. Reinvesting in preserving this housing stock at only ten thousand uh, dollars per apartment is by far the least expensive way the city can provide another 20 years of well-managed affordable housing. Durham Community Land Trustees does, in fact, um, maintain replacement reserves for these units, and we have used these reserves to address the most pressing health and safety issues in these units. These units are currently 100% occupied, and in, actually there, some of the units have actually had the original tenants from 1993 still in those units. All of these units will remain permanently affordable because that's the mission of Durham Community Land Trusts. Being able to preserve stable, affordable housing in Durham's western neighborhoods is, a vital, is of vital importance in a community where, value, where home values are rapidly increasing. However, it is not enough for DCLT units to be permanently affordable. They must also live up to the quality of housing that we require for our residents. And your support of this request will allow this to happen. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, Ms. Shamika Reinhart. Good evening. I'm Shamika Reinhart. I am a member of the Citizens Advisory Committee. Um, I have been for probably about six months, and I live at 3202 Sugar Pine Trail here in Durham, 27713. Um, it is an honor and privilege to speak as a committee member of the Citizens Advisory Committee. The Citizens Advisory Committee concurs with the Department of Community Develop Ve Development's funding recommendations in the draft 2014 through 2015 annual action plan. The Citizens Advisory Committee works to enhance the quality of life for citizens of Durham by advising the Durham City Council and the Durham Board of County Commissioners on housing and community development needs to improve housing quality and affordability and economic opportunities for low and moderate income families. Additionally, the Citizens Advisory Committee evaluates applications and makes annual recommendations to the City Council and the Board of County Commissioners concerning the allocation of community development block grant funds, home investment partnership program, and emergency shelter grants funds to sub-recipients. Prior to discussion and evaluation of applications, the Citizens Advisory Committee signed a conflict of interest statement to, to exercise reasonable care and impartial judgment when executing the duties and responsibilities of the Citizens Advisory Committee to maintain the public trust and integrity of the Citizens Advisory Committee. The need and demand for affordable housing is growing throughout the nation including Durham. Our strategies to address the rising demand has centered on housing production and retention. Finding a decent, affordable home is a challenge, yet the core of the challenge is in the insufficient strategies to expand economic opportunity. One strategy is to create synergy between housing, economic development, and transportation by including innovative training programs for businesses relocating or expanding in Durham to prove the readiness of low to moderate income persons to meet the workforce needs of the, of the jobs relocating to the area and reserving affordable housing near future rail lines to connect to major employment centers. By equipping low and moderate income families with professional development opportunities, we improve the quality of life here in Durham for those families thereby preserving the affordable housing stock for our most needy residents. To best serve our citizens and maintain sustainable progress, we must ensure all citizens connect with employment opportunity to allow growth and prosperity. The Citizens Advisory Committee would like to thank Reginald Johnson, Director of the Department of Community Development, Larry Jarvis, Assistant Director, and Wilma Conyers, our Federal Programs Coordinator for their assistance, availability, responsiveness, and accommodations which were invaluable in aiding the members of the Citizens Advisory Committee in performing our duties. 
The Citizens Advisory Committee looks forward to continuing to work with the City Council, Board of County Commissioners, Department of Community Development, and Citizens of Durham to ensure that all Durham citizens have an active role in community development and suitable living environments. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. Have a wonderful evening. Uh, Alexander Herring. Good evening. My name is Alexander Herring. I'm the Program Director for Urban Ministries of Durham, located at 410 Liberty Street, Durham, North Carolina. At first, uh, Mr. Mayor and Council Members, I would like to first say thank you for your past support and all that you have, the support you have given to Urban Ministry over the years. Thank you to the city workers and the Department um, and Durham PD who volunteers in our community CAF throughout the year. I want to reiterate the importance of partnership and collaboration here in Durham County. I took this position two and a half years ago and I remember when I met our Mayor Pro Tem, Ms. Cor McFatton, and I told her I was from Raleigh, she said he's not a Durham County resident. But my heart is in Durham. I love the residents, I love this area, but one thing I can say about Durham that very differs from Wake County, I've never seen the collaboration any other city I've worked in like Durham. So the partnership with Housing for New Hope, the partnership uh, that helps reduce the time our clients spend in the shelter. We've developed new programs with partners throughout the city. And as I leave here tonight, I plan to go home and pack my bags because I'm headed to Chicago to speak at a conference. S last year, CEF, the Empowerment Fund, we came together and, for and uh, applied for a federal grant and we got it. Our program that we developed they want to hear more about it because they want to try and make it a national model. So this is something to the credit to your benefit, to what you have helped us do. So again, I encourage you to approve the budget as written. Thank you. Uh, Frank Moore. Good evening. My name is Frank Moore. I stay at uh, 810 North Duke Street in Durham, North Carolina. And I'd just like to speak about Housing for New Hope. Um, they are a success because they make their clients a success. Uh, Mr. Alexander Herring spoke on the collaboration with uh, Housing for New Hope. Uh, the unwavering professionalism and the integrity uh, that both entities provide to give uh, service to the, uh, the uh, community is impeccable. Thank you. May I ask once more, this is a public hearing. Uh, I want to make sure that people have an opportunity to speak if they would like to speak. Uh, is there anyone else that wants to speak on this item that has not had a chance to speak? Uh, let the record reflect that no one else asked to speak at this public hearing. I will close the public hearing. This matter is now back before the council. Recognize the mayor pro tem, recognize Councilman Moffitt, Councilman Katati, Steve, Councilman Shul, in that order. Thank you. I'd just like to thank everyone for their um, participation in this public hearing. Uh, to the gentleman from Urban Ministries, that is an abiding question uh, for me. Uh, I, I just like to promote Durham, and uh, I still invite you to become a Durham citizen uh, whenever that's convenient for you. <laughs> Chicago, oh, you just packed up to go to Chicago. Okay. When you said that you were packing, I thought maybe you were about to say you were coming to Durham. <laughs> I, I recognize the work that uh, Housing for New Hope does, and I recognize what community land trustees also do. Um, we really appreciate what you do. Um, so what we want to do is make sure that uh, our advertisements and uh, notification to the public uh, are done in a timely fashion so that everyone knows what we're doing. Thank you for coming tonight. Thank you. Recognize Councilman Moffitt. Thank you. Um, first, I want to thank everyone who came here to testify tonight, especially those of you 
who uh, shared difficult stories with us. It helps remind all of us that uh, it's real people behind the numbers and the words. It's not just programs. I want to also thank staff for the supplemental memo responding to the issues raised at the work session. And I particularly want to thank my colleague, uh, Steve Shul, who uh, spent quite a bit of time with me just trying to help me understand um, sort of the landscape of all the different programs that are included in the uh, action plan. Is that it? Recognize Councilwoman Katari. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I also want to thank everyone who came and for our truly great service providers. This is such important work that you do, and we really appreciate it. Um, I have some questions for staff. Again, um, I want to thank you for the additional information and the uh, shift to accommodate the Habitat City Second Mortgages. I didn't see an update on Attachment 17 or E. Are you going to be providing a new chart with the shifted funds? It wasn't clear to me. No? Yes, we will be providing an updated chart with the uh, funds. So in terms of what we're approving tonight, we're approving what's in the memo, not exactly what's in the chart. Is that correct? That is correct. You're approving what's in the one amend, one change is made in the memo that's communicated to you mem in the memo. We will make the change in the chart in the, the draft annual action plan. Okay. Do you want to very briefly summarize those three points or do you want me to be specific about what my questions are? Let's address the, the chart because we did update the chart. Okay, I didn't see that. Councilperson Katani, mm -hmm. we did up the chart, update the chart on May first as it relates to lines number nine, number ten, and number eleven. Okay, I'm having trouble opening it. Give me one sec. Um, we increase the home buyer assistance as it relates to line okay. number eleven. I got it. From 120,000 to 180,000 to accommodate at least nine habitat home buyers in northeast central Durham. Okay. Apparently, I didn't re-update that. I have the memo, but my chart still shows the original amount. So okay. that's what my confusion was. We made the. So you do have 180 in the chart. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Um, okay. Great. Does your show that? Anyways. Um, I wanted to note on the, one other point on item 23, the 192,000 for um, essentially for Vermillion. I don't, I can't have both things open at the same time. Um, I will say that um, I'm slightly uncomfortable with that, as I mentioned at work session. Um, I'll look forward to the additional information when this item comes back individually to council. I really want to see, um, I guess. Uh, more information regarding the need for that gap financing. I do have some concerns about when we had both Vermillion and the Witted School project and Vermillion got approved, Witted then got pushed back and there were significant opportunity costs to the city and I, um, again it feels like we're approving funding for them uh, after the fact and so I just want to have a better understanding of that. We'll provide that uh, okay. when the item comes before the council. Great. Thank you. Is that, is that it? I recognize Councilman Shule. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, I know that the staff probably won't be that happy to hear that I was the one educating Don about the housing because uh, maybe I don't know quite as much about it as I ought to. Um, just a, a couple of things. And one of the things I was trying to sort of think about the big picture of this, and I was looking at, at the way in which HUD funding has changed in the last few years. and. Just to, just to sort of think about where our national priorities are, if you take HUD funding, the entire HUD funding for this country this year, it would take 70 years of funding at that level to pay for the amount that was spent on the Iraq War. So the Iraq War, approximately so far, about $2 trillion in expenses, and of course, there'll be more as, as veteran services are needed into the future. That's about 70 years worth of HUD funding. We could build a lot of, of housing and subsidize a lot of housing with that. So I just, uh, that's only relevant to this in the, in, the sense, in, in the sense that we're trying to think about our, our nation and what kind of policies that we ought to have. Um, so I have a couple of questions, and, and one is, 
um, I, I'm constantly uh, trying to figure out, I, I know that CDBG and home funds uh, overlap a great deal in how they can be used, but I'm never completely sure, uh, even when I read the specificity, about sort of what the, what the, what is the general difference between the two of them? So I'm going to turn it over to uh, Larry Jarvis, Assistant Director, to elaborate, but I would also want to make one clarification. While there might be overlap in organizations, there's a, he'll elaborate that we need to be clear about the distinction between the two different types of funds. Right. Thank you. Good evening. Larry Jarvis, Assistant Director. One of the primary differences between home funds and CWG funds is that CWG funds cannot be used to finance new construction. Home funds can. Okay. Uh, with CWG, you can do things like acquisition, you can do site prep and infrastructure, but you can't finance the development of housing. I see. So that's why home was created basically to fill that gap to have a mechanism for financing affordable housing. Okay, great. That's very helpful. Thank you very much. Um, it looks to me like doing the math that the AMI is now around for family four is now around $66,000. Is that about the, the figure that, we, that we're using now? I was using that 80% number and doing some math. Does that sound about right? Probably the new 2014 uh, income limits just came out and they did drop slightly, but not mm -hmm. significantly. Mm -hmm. Wilmer just handed this to me. The 80% for a family of four is 52,550. Okay, all right, I see. So yeah, that would, so that would be, okay, close. Thanks. And then the, the um, you got about 50% uh, of, our, house, of, our, of our housing units here in Durham, rental units, or I guess that's our total housing units of our 100,000, uh, face a housing burden. Does that mean that more than 30% of the income of that household goes in rent? Is that how you define the housing burden? Um, for renters, the housing burden uh, most often is uh, that they are paying more than 30% of their income towards rent. And of course, when you look at it in detail, you can be severely burdened, which means more than 50% of the income is going towards housing expenses. And how about, how do we define burden for a homeowner? Burden for a homeowner is in some cases you could actually have that homeowner uh, paying more than 30% of their income for uh, uh, principal and interest payment and utilities. And, and housing burden is a, is a kind of a national concept, isn't it? It's something it's, that it's HUD a, defines. HUD definitions, correct. Yeah. So um, if I read you right, then 50% of the housing units in Durham are either, either homeowners or renters are, how, are uh, face housing burdens, paying more than 30% of their income in either rent or their mortgage. Right now I don't have the, the numbers that you're looking at in front of me, well, but that, 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 was that in sounds the about right. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. Yes. That's a lot. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I want to reiterate um, what my colleagues have said. Uh, it was good to see that, uh, thank you for making the change to include the Habitat Seconds. I think that's a great change and appreciate that. Um, and. Uh, Diane has raised the uh, question about Vermilion, but we'll hear back mm -hmm. on that when the time comes. Right. And, uh, and, I, and I share her concerns um, and would be anxious to hear um, when, when the time comes about uh, how important it is to make sure that we're able to build those units and, and, and how critical that ends up being. Um, the, um, so just, uh, Again, I, I want to reiterate something I said at work session, which basically is that uh, when we were looking at the at the at the, um, the five-year housing chart, which included the, the 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 dedicated funding source as well as these sources, and and there's a lot of good news in there, and uh, the success of Southside that we're seeing so far, and I know we'll continue to see uh, the great results in the rapid rehousing, which we've heard uh, from. Uh, Joey and, and Cynthia and the Glasper family, uh, and which it was really good to see the, the numbers uh, on that, which were great. Uh, the fact that we're feeling a lot better about the trend of, of HUD funding. Uh, and 
I was particularly glad to see sort of in the out years of this five-year plan that we're planning to be a partner with, a, with Durham Housing Authority in the redevelopment of, of uh, McDougal Terrace area and the Choice Neighborhoods Initiative and what we're identifying here as a large area of southeast central Durham. So I like that that planning was in there and that we're, because I think that is going to be really, really critical for our community going forward. I was really glad to see the emphasis in not creating a, recreating a concentration of poverty. Um, glad to see the mention of the possible work around the Austin Avenue rail station. Um, and so all those things I thought were very forward looking in the plan and, and are reflected in what we're approving tonight. Um, and I know that this reflects a really prodigious effort and I'm really appreciative uh, Larry and Reginald and, and Wilma and the whole staff of, of what you all have done. My, my concerns are, are um, in, my general concerns uh, are that uh, that we continue to work with our, or that we, with the, as the planning department develops the housing slash transit plan, that we're in close touch with them with community development. I know you will be, but I think that's a, that's really important. Uh, and then uh, you've, you've partially addressed this with with Habitat, but I do want to say that when I think about what you've done, you've done a great job in identifying how we're doing, in, in sort of continuing to do what we need to do in Southwest Central Durham. Now you've identified the kind of out year work in Southeast Central Durham, McDougal Terrace area. And of course we have Southside as a huge point of emphasis. What's, which doesn't receive much emphasis in here is Northeast Central Durham. And I just want to reiterate again what I said the other day that um, given the Mayor's Poverty Initiative, which I think is a great thing, and the census track that we're focusing on, uh, particularly I think it would be good to think ahead in, 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 in future years about a, a, a more explicit plan for Northeast Central Durham. And, the habitat uh, seconds are, are, a great, are a great step in that direction, but I did want to mention that as I think something important for the future. Um, and, and then again, uh, you know, continuing to work with the housing authority I think is going to be critical, and I appreciate that you've, that you've, that you've got that in there. So um, in general, I think it's a really good plan, and uh, I, I think that the, the change with the habitat seconds is, is, is very good. And I really appreciate uh, appreciate the work you've done, and look forward to voting for it. Okay. Can I say one more thing? I wanted to note that uh, Terry Alabas here, and I believe Terry is retiring uh, from his job in a couple weeks. Terry, and uh, I just wanted to note that for many many years, Terry has done a wonderful job leading housing for New Hope, and uh, he, he's surrounded by staff and clients. And uh, thank you, Terry. It's fabulous work. Well, Steve, if we hadn't planned, uh, you can plan to get up at 7.30 tomorrow morning and be at the breakfast, be there at 7.30. I don't know what time you have to get up. I know what time I got to get up, but uh, it's at 7.30 tomorrow at American Tobacco, uh, Bay 7. I, I uh, just, just have a, one or two questions, and I, I want to follow up with um, the Habitat for Humanity seconds. And um, Do you have any sense as to what that would do in terms of increasing the number of units they will be able to provide with that? I would have to ask uh, Blake what the net increase would be, but again, um, given that the effect of the 20000 that we provide to the home buyer is $20,000 less that that Habitat has to uh, finance, it reduces the amount of paper they would have to hold. Uh, one would think that that additional 180,000 probably would result in four additional units net they would be able to do than if they didn't have the seconds. All right, if you could find okay. a little bit more about that. And the reason I raise it, aside from the fact it's already been raised here, um, I, I've been impressed with what they've been able to do in terms of not just new houses, but rehabilitation. And since they've decided to focus their attention over the Northeast Central Durham area, uh, and of course, with the anti reducing poverty place, we're not talking about new dollars as such, but it seems to me it allows them an opportunity to have a greater impact in that area if in fact they are 
going to folks, as they said, and if they have more dollars to build more units, I think that even goes goes along further. So I'd like a little bit crisp understanding as to what those dollars would do for them over in that okay. area. Uh, one one other point, I, I was struck by the comment that was made by the Durham Community Land Trust uh, in terms of um, rehabilitation of units and how, how many more units could be done with $300,000. I know this was $103,000 in this budget. Was that presented to you guys when you were putting together the plan? Um, Selena was speaking to the $300,000 that we're recommending and that she had requested mm -hmm. for the preservation of rental units. Yeah. In addition to that, she had requested and is being recommended for $103,000 uh, that would be used for repairs to owner-occupied units okay. that uh, DCLT had produced in their early history. Okay, thank you That's for that clarification. Let me ask you, are there other comments, questions uh, on this item? This has been a public hearing. If not, I entertain a motion on item before us. Well, that we receive second. a comment. It's been properly moved and second. Madam Clerk, will you open the vote? Close the vote. It passes seven to zero. Thank you. Just received a comment. Uh, next public hearing item is item 26. M Mr. Let's Mayor? move to, I guess, back to number Mr. seven. Mr. Mayor? Yeah, sure. Uh, the council does need to adopt the annual action plan. We voted to receive the comments. Second. It's been properly moved and second. Madam Clerk, we open the vote. Close the vote. It passes seven to zero. Item seven was a consent agenda item, and that was the one we said we we're going to do after we did, heard item 26. Second. It's been properly moved and second. Madam Clerk, will you open the vote? We need to do item, uh, to hold a public hearing on number 26, 26 then go to seven. I'm sorry, but my mistake, I was on 25, going, going on 26. Uh, public hearing on the proposed amendments to the FY 2011, 2012, 2012, 2013, and 2013, 2014 annual action plan. Again, it's a public hearing, open public hearing. Comments from the staff. Wilmer Conyers, Federal Programs Coordinator. The purpose of this public hearing is to receive citizen comments on the proposed amendments for the FY 2011, 2012, the 2012-2013, and the 2013-2014 annual action plans. Citizen participation plan contained in the adopted 2010-2015 consolidated plan requires that a public hearing be conducted for formal amendments that add, delete, or substantially change the consolidated plan or the annual action plan. Notice of this meeting was advertised in the Herald Sun distributed via general listserv and posted on the Department of Communities Community Development website on April 4th and advertised in the Carolina Times on April 5th. The proposed amendments rec represent a reconciliation of the grant funds to the city's general ledger and assist with the timely expenditure and administration of community development block grant funds, home investment partnership, and emergency solution grant funds. These amendments are needed to meet the respective federal deadlines as it relates, relates to each grant. These proposed amendments rep represent a reconciliation of $2,044,750 in home funds, $74,000 in CDBG funds, and $11,082 in ESG funds. Proposed amendments were made available for the public review beginning April 4th through May 5th, 2014 at the Department of Community Development on its website at the Durham County Main Library, the City and County Clerk's offices, the front desk of City Hall, and were distributed via a general listserv. Comments from this public hearing and a summary of written comments received from citizens will be incorporated to the end, the final amendments for the submission to HUD. Later tonight on the agenda, we request council to approve the proposed amendments to the FY 2011, 2012, 2012, 2013, 
and the 2013-2014 annual action plans. Okay, the public hearing is open. You heard a staff report. I recognize comments by the council first, if there are comments. Uh, I don't have anyone that had signed up to speak on this item. I would ask if anyone in the audience that would like to speak on this item this being a public hearing. Uh, let the record reflect that no one asked to speak on this item. I'll close the public hearing and matters back before the council. Second. So it's been moved and second. Madam Clerk, will you open the vote? And close the vote. It passes seven to zero. Okay, can we move now to item seven on the consent agenda on this particular item? It's been properly moved and second. Madam Clerk, will you open the vote? Close the vote. It passes seven to zero. Thank you. We'll go to the next public hearing item, which is item 27, uh, amendment to the city county inspections permit fee ordinance. Good evening, Mayor, Mayor Pro Tem, City Council members, Gene Bradham, Director of City County Inspections. Uh, first of all, I'd like to acknowledge that the proper notifications uh, regarding this particular public hearing uh, have been met. An ad was placed in the newspaper, uh, a notice was placed on the city's website, and a notice was placed in the lobby of City Hall. In addition to that, we reached out to the Home Builders Association, to the General Contractors Association, and sent out email notifications to all of our mechanical and our plumbing contractors that we had email addresses for in our database. Agenda item number 27 is to conduct a public hearing and to receive comments on the City County Inspections Permit Fee Ordinance. Uh, as you're aware, the Inspections Department strives to keep up and maintain a fee schedule that is basically designed to recover the costs that's associated with performing the required inspections that are state mandated. The department uh, performs thorough evaluations to, to determine the specific trade permit fees that are not covering the cost that are associated with the required work to perform those inspections. The last uh, comprehensive fee increase that we had was back in July of 2011. And then the last increase prior to that, prior to the 2011 increase, was all the way back in 2000, so 11 years prior to that date. The proposed fee changes that we have before you tonight are not a comprehensive increase, and they do not change any of the permit fees for new single-family permits or for new commercial permits. The fees that are changing reflect new categories for uh, uh, fees that, for items that are not included in the fee schedule. Uh, some for the removal of certain fees that aren't, aren't necessary any longer. Uh, some for the changing of the wording of certain categories that are for clarity purposes only. And then for the increases of a few specific categories. Now, one of the new items in the proposed uh, that we have before the proposal tonight is a re-review fee for plans review. Um, this would be similar to the, the re-inspection fee that we've had in place for a long time in the field inspection process. Um, when an applicant doesn't correct all of the items that we've pointed out in a plan review process, the purpose of this proposal, there would be a progressive fee charged if we have to go back in and they didn't correct all the items and we have to go back and correct it and tell them, no, you didn't get three of those, come back and do that again. So that's the purpose of that. Um, and obviously the purpose is to encourage accurate and complete information when the plans are resubmitted just to make the, the whole process more efficient. And then a second new item is charging a reinspection fee for the first reinspection on heating and ventilation and air conditioning equipment replacements. Again, this is to encourage contractors to perform the work completely and accurately the first time, which would improve the efficiency of that field inspections process related to those. Uh, it would also eliminate the need for homeowners to have to get off work a second time for a reinspection that really wasn't necessary. The, the few items that have an actual fee increase for the permit that's associated with them are necessary to recover the costs that's associated with the, uh, the work involved in doing those inspections. With the proposed uh, fee increases, Durham would still be in line with the peer cities that uh, have been in, on the list that you've included uh, for peer cities, as well as the fees charged by the surrounding jurisdictions. I'll be glad to try and answer any questions that you might have, and I have Roy Brockwell, our assistant director, with me tonight that uh, worked on the fee study. Thank you. Uh, this is a public hearing. You've heard the staff report. Let me ask are there comments, questions by members of the council. Uh, is there anyone in the public that wants to speak on this item, uh, proposed inspection fee changes? Uh, let the record reflect that no one in the public has to speak on this item. I will declare the public hearing to be closed. Matter of fact, before council. It's been properly moved and seconded. Madam Clerk, will you open the vote? Close the vote. It passes 7 to 0. Uh, item 
28 is a comprehensive plan amendment, UDI form, and I'm going to ask to be excused from this item, item 28, as well as item 29, because I'm an employee of UDI, CDC, it says UDI form. And ask the Mayor Pro Tem, if you would take over, please. Do you have any? The next item before us, uh, as the mayor said, is public hearing item on comprehensive plan amendment UDI farm A1400001. Is there a report from staff on this item? Thank you, Madam Mayor Pro Tem and members of council, Pat Young with the planning department. Um, I can first certify that the public hearing items before you tonight have been advertised in accordance with the requirements of law and their affidavits to that effect on file with the planning department. Uh, the case before you is A14000001. It's an application by UDI, Community Development Corporation, uh, which is requesting a change to the future land use designation of uh, 2.6 acres of an approximately 5.9 acre parcel located at 4601 Industry Lane from its current future land use map designation of office to the future land use designation of low density residential, uh, which would allow agricultural operations, which you'll hear more about in the forthcoming action. Uh, based on staff's review of the four criteria for comprehensive land use plan amendments, staff recommends approval of this request and the Planning Commission considered and recommended approval of this item by a vote of 12 to 1 at its March 11, 2014 meeting. I'll be happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you. Are there questions, comments from council members? If not, I declare the public hearing open. I have one person who has signed up to speak on this item, and that is Patrick Biker. Uh, I will give you three minutes, sir, if that's adequate. Uh, it should be less than that, Mayor Pro Tem. Good evening, Mayor Pro Tem, members of the City Council. My name is Patrick Biker. I live at 2614 Stewart Drive. I'm an attorney with Morningstar Law Group in Durham, and I'm here tonight representing UDI CDC for this comprehensive plan amendment. With me tonight from UDI is the Executive Director, Ed Stewart, along with our very own Durham expert on aquaponics, Kevin Hammock. We greatly appreciate the support of the Planning Department for this plan amendment application. We do not have much to add to the staff report in your agenda package, which, which documents several valid reasons for changing this parcel from office to low density residential. However, we do wish to highlight that UDI has marketed this site for office development over many years and there simply is not demand for office at this location. Given the extent of the floodplain conditions on this parcel, it is not really a viable office location on account of the limited buildable area suitable for an office building. Accordingly, the agricultural use allowed in low density residential, which allows for the aquaponics portion of our vegetable growing endeavor, is the most appropriate designation for this property. And so for all those reasons, we respectfully ask for your approval and I'll be happy to try to answer any questions. Thank you. Are there others who would like to speak on this item? If not, I will declare the public hearing closed and the matter is back before the body. And Madam Clerk, would you open the vote? It passes six to zero and Mayor Bell will be uh, abstaining. The next matter then uh, public hearing matter is zoning map change. UDI farm uh, case Z140001. Uh, entertain a staff report now. Thank you, sir. Good evening again, I'm Madam Mayor Pro Tem and members of Council Pat Young with the Planning Department. KZ 14000001 is a UDI farm. UDI Community Development Corporation is requesting a change to the zoning designation of an approximately 5.9 acre parcel at a 4601 industry lane from its current zoning designation of office institutional or OI to residential suburban 20 or RS 20 uh, to accommodate a proposed agricultural use. Um, the proposed RS 20 zoning is consistent with the residential um, uses and zoning to the north and east of the site and this request is consistent with the future land use designation of low density residential and recreation and open space. Uh, staff has also determined that this request is consistent with other adoptive policies and ordinances uh, of city council. 
Uh, if the requested RS-20 zoning designation is approved, the applicant has indicated their intent to develop the site for agricultural purposes, including aquaponics. Uh, Planning Commission recommended approval at their March 11th, 2014 meeting by a vote of 12 to 1. I'll be happy to take any questions. Thank you very much. Are there comments or questions from council members? If not, I will declare the public hearing open. Mr. Biker, you have how many minutes do you want? Two or three? Two, two or okay, three. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Good evening again, Mayor Pro Tem, Cole McFadden, and members of the council. My name is Patrick Biker. I still live at 2614 Stewart Drive. I'm an attorney with Morningstar Law Group, and I'm here representing UDI CDC. We are requesting your approval of the zoning map change for a relatively small section of UDI's property along the south side of East Cornwallis Road at the intersection with Industry Lane. We're requesting this rezoning to RS-20 so that UDI can develop these six acres as an agricultural use that, that will create an exciting, urban farming opportunity for Durham, since RS-20 is one of the two zoning districts that allows for aquaponics. We had about a 45-minute presentation on aquaponics, but given the time constraints, we won't go into that. Uh, UDI has, has secured a grant from the Federal Economic Development Administration to develop these six acres as a commercial vegetable garden and an aquaponics facility, facility that can grow fish, fruit, and vegetables. The aquaponics component is necessary to make our endeavor financially sustainable. Long story short, aquaponics allows for an increased yield of vegetables without the use of fertilizers, along with the added benefit of providing several kinds of fish for sale. Accordingly, this is a project that will exemplify community-supported agriculture and further enhance Durham's reputation as a leader in the farm-to-table movement. As I am sure many of you on the City Council will, re will recall from last year, Southern Living Magazine named Durham the tastiest town of the South. That was a fantastic award for our city, but Durham should not rest on its laurels. This rezoning will allow Durham to move forward with sustainable new jobs and efficient urban agricultural practices that will increase the production of locally grown food and solidify Durham's leadership position as the food mecca of the South. We appreciate the support of the Planning Department and the Planning Commission in recommending approval of this item, and we respectfully ask for your approval, and our team will be happy to try to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Biker. Uh, this is a public hearing, so if there are others who would like to speak. If not, I will close the public hearing and the matters back before the council. Yes, sir. What kind of fish? Then Ms. Gattati and then I believe Ms. we're focusing on tilapia, perch, anything else? Probably tilapia and perch, Councilman Shule. Okay. And do you have any requests? I, mean, I don't, but that'll, that sounds fine. Thank you. Uh, I think it's, you know, I was, when uh, when I uh, first heard about this, uh, my first thought was, was Kevin Hammock involved because he's been before us when we were talking about the, uh, the uh, changes in the uh, UDO to accommodate uh, more urban agriculture. And uh, so I was glad when I found that out that he was indeed, and I know that he'll bring some real expertise and commitment to it. So good luck to you. Thank you, appreciate it. Councilwoman Katari. Thank you, Mayor Pro Tem. Um, I also think the project is exciting. I do have a question though, um, perhaps to staff, perhaps to the applicant. Um, in terms of water supply impacts, it was evaluated on nine single family residential units. Can anyone talk about the uh, water impact? or what you're proposing to do in terms of recapturing, use of rainwater, other, well, we all know farming is uh, water intensive. Thanks. Right. Yes, yes. thank you, Council Member Katati. Uh, once the tanks are full, it really should just be a, a fairly closed loop system. So um, other than occasional re-topping off of the tanks, once the tanks are full, it should be pretty, pretty, pretty subtle. And our, you know, the cisterns to make sure that the fish are preserved, um, you know, for until they're ready to be sold. But uh, we're, we're optimistic that it'll be, uh, you know, a one-time, sort of like filling a swimming pool, a uh, one-time uh, expenditure. But then after that, it, um, we think it'll be a, a pretty closed loop, pretty tight closed loop system. As a matter of fact, if you look at the pizza place next door, you can sort of see it in a, you know, interior small scale. You did raise an issue in the past, and I don't, honestly remember and I know we're getting a presentation on water rates this coming Thursday 
Um, will they pay a premium to fill the tanks just like uh, people that fill swimming pools get? Mm -hmm. Thanks. Okay. And um, the one thing I didn't hear you address was the farming aspect and water use there. Thanks. Kevin Hammock, 219 West Trinity Avenue in Durham. Um, as far as the farming, we will be incorporating uh, cisterns for water capture. So there will be, when, say, in a very extreme drought, we will use some city water, but the, the goal is to uh, save as much rainwater capture as we can or use it. Was it did you say it was Tier 3? I'm sorry, I didn't hear the answer. Was that? Okay, thank you. Martha? Thank you. Um, I, would you just briefly just walk us through, so that I have a clear sense of the operations that you're planning to do here? Could you just, what, what's included? I understand aquaponics included in something under the rubric farming, but I just want to know what that right. means. So we'll have kind of a mix of the aquaponics, which is a recirculating system. Um, you've got fish and, you know, there's fish water. We take that water and we um, recirculate it through the plant beds, and the plant beds suck out your nitrates. That's basically your, your fertilizer, but it's a natural fertilizer. Um, in addition to that, we'll have kind of more traditional gardening, farming, whatever you want to call it. Um, we'll be doing it year-round in hoop houses, greenhouses, um, the little hoop, hoop tunnels or some of our row vegetables. But basically, we plan on uh, growing uh, a variety of vegetables uh, year-round. Outside of the fish, any animals? No animals. Okay, thank you. Let's count uh, worms. And I, excuse me? Let's count worms. Okay, thank you. And, and the water, if I understand a closed loop system, you're talking about the water from the fish tanks is going into the plant beds. Right, and returns and, cleaned back to the fish. Okay. So the plants suck out your nitrates. And are the fish tanks covered? Um, depending on the fish, very often we do cover them. Okay, so they're, like a swimming pool, there will be some evaporation. There will be some, right. but um, it, it does help for, with evaporation to keep them covered, and we've looked at several systems, and I'm probably leaning towards having most of them covered. Right. Okay, good. Plus good they luck. Like to, they like to jump, so keep them covered and keep them getting under control. Thank you. Then I have a question for staff. It's an unusual use for a RS-20, and I'm just uh, verifying that all of the RS-20 setbacks and other UDO requirements, whether it's a house or a farm or whatever, are all in place. Is that, I'm verifying that, please. Right. Uh, so Councilman Moffitt, Pat Young with the Planning Department. Yeah, all, all structural setbacks that apply to residential properties would be in place. It's actually somewhat more stringent because there's a 50-foot um, setback for um, any livestock operations or other agricultural operations. Thank you. Scatati. Thank you. I had another question. You raised it when you talked about covering the pools. Um, what is your experience with odor and fish in uh, aquaponics? Well, um, Thank you. I've visited several around the country and there's no odor. It, right. uh, the best example I can say is to walk across the street to the new pizza place and there's no odor. Yeah, and I went to a fish production facility this weekend just to verify my experience. It was a probably a three acre, probably larger than what UDI is proposing. I mean, maybe my sense of smell isn't as good as the next guy's, but I couldn't smell anything and I was standing right next to it. So a good example is, and I actually just uh, met with him yesterday, Will Allen up in Milwaukee. He's got a three acre uh, farm with uh, 20 or 30,000 gallons of aquaponics and there's a neighborhood right behind him and there's absolutely no smell and the neighbors love him. Right, so. yeah, this is really taking off in the high really high density urban areas like New York City, Hong Kong, places like that. So we haven't experienced anything of that sort. Are there other questions? Yes, sir. Mr. Uh, the grant comes with some uh, uh, requirements about job creation. Is that right? And can you talk about that a little bit? We propose to create 40 jobs over a three-year period of time. <clears throat> Mrs. Sir, would you tell us who you are? Oh, my name is Ed Stewart. <laughs> I serve as president of UDI Community Development Corporation over the last 44 years. You didn't need that. <laughs> that was my question. Thank you very much. Thank you. I will entertain a motion on this item, please. 
motion moved and properly seconded. Madam Clerk, would you please open the vote? It passes six to zero, and Mayor Bell is abstaining. Let's move to item 30. Thank you, Mr. Mayor, members of council, Pat Young again with the planning department. Uh, item 30 is case SC 13-0006 is a requested um, street closing of 127 linear foot segment of Veston Avenue, which is uh, just west of Chapel Hill Road. Um, the request is by B. Wallace Design and Construction. Um, this right of way is at the terminal point of currently of Veston Avenue. The property is bordered by a uh, property owned by the applicant and by Lakewood Elementary School on the, uh, on the north side. Um, if this action is approved, the right of way would be closed and be recombined with the adjacent properties, 50% um, to the applicant, 50% to the uh, Durham Public Schools. Um, thank you. I'll be happy to take any questions. Uh, this is a public hearing. You've heard a staff report. I would ask other questions by members of the council. Uh, if not, we have one person that has signed up to speak, uh, Mr. John Blakely. Is Mr. Blakely present? Mr. Berkeley, you have uh, three minutes. Yeah. Should, um, John Blackley uh, of Eden's Land Corps, um, 2314 South Miami Boulevard, Suite 151, Durham 27703. And I'm here um, representing the um, B. Wallace Design and Construction and um, have a, nothing further to add, but here to add, answer any questions you may have. Okay, thank you. Let me ask other questions, <clears throat> Mr. Blakely. Uh, if not, uh, thank you. Okay. Uh, are there other persons that want to speak on this item? Uh, let the record reflect no one else asked to speak. The public hearing is closed. The matter is back before the council. Entertain a motion on the item. Move the item. Second. It's been properly moved and second. Madam Clerk, will you open the vote? Close the vote. It passes 7 to 0. Thank you. Uh, the last item is a supplemental item Police Department 2014 first quarter summer report by Chief Lopez. Mr. Mayor, Council, Mr. Manager, Sir, City Attorney. I'm here tonight to present the Police Department's 2014 first quarter report. The quarterly report covers the department's six performing measures, violent crime, property crime, part one index crime, clearance rates, response times to priority one calls, and staffing levels, and also significant events during the first quarter. There are several highlights during the first quarter. The Durham Police Department seized more than 33 pounds of synthetic marijuana in February during a traffic stop on Interstate 85. An Alabama man was arrested on tra uh, drug trafficking charges, and it was the largest seizure of synthetic marijuana, which is also known as Spice and K2 in the department's history. Funded by a grant from the Fox Family Foundation, investigators from the Special Victims Unit outfitted existing office space to serve as a soft interview room for child victims and witnesses of sexual assault crimes. The soft interview room provides a more comfortable and relaxed environment to conduct necessary interviews with young interviewees. During the first quarter, the police department started training to participate in the new Durham County Misdemeanor Diversion Program, focusing on 16 and 17 year olds. This program allows officers to refer first-time misdemeanor offenders to a diversion program instead of filing criminal charges, which could have a long-time negative effect. This program does not include sexual offense charges, firearms charges, or traffic offenses. The first-time offenders are referred to specific diversion programs and attend a session in diversion court. 
If they did not complete their program within 90 days, they can be charged with the original criminal offense. We're encouraging our officers to be engaged in this program. More than 500 youths in Durham would have been eligible for this program in 2012, and this is based on core statistics. Part one violent crime was up by 36% in the first quarter compared to 2013. The rise in violent crime was driven by an increase in the number of aggravated assaults. We quickly recognized early in the first quarter that multi-victim incidents such as shootings into crowds or occupied residences were pushing up these numbers. This particular type of crime is a very cowardly act because the shooters have no idea who might be in the line of fire. We organized a multi-agency violent incident response to target locations where these incidents were occurring and the people believed to be involved. We gathered intelligence information to determine why these incidents were occurring, and we have plans to use all the necessary resources to, fo to focus on this issue. This is a high priority for the department, and we've seen the number of shootings into occupied dwellings go down in recent weeks. At this point, it appears that our efforts are having an impact. We had 149 victims. There were 176 incidents with 254 victims during the first quarter of 2014. We have investigated seven homicides year to date compared to eight on this date last year. Arrests have been made in five of the seven cases and there's a known suspect in the sixth case. There's one open case and we have two cases that involve domestic violence. Robberies were up in the first quarter, but investigators made several arrests which cleared multiple cases. Several of these arrests are mentioned in your executive summary. The number of reported rapes dropped during the first quarter. I also wanted to mention that investigators of our special victims unit have met with principals in the Durham Public Schools to give them information about social media safety for students and how to spot potential issues such as those in the recent cases in the area involving photos on Instagram. Property crime was up by 10% during the first quarter of 2014. The rise was caused by an increase in burglaries and larcenies. Larcenies made up half of all part one index crimes during the first quarter. Investigators made several arrests that cleared multiple burglaries during the first quarter. In many cases, there were several people working together to commit these burglaries. Investigators also arrested three persons and cleared dozens of cases involving the thefts of catalytic converters from vehicles. Motor vehicle thefts were at a three-year low during the first quarter. We made an effort to remind people not to leave their cars unattended uh, while running to warm them up during the cold winter months. We continue to urge people to dial 911 to report suspicious activities. These calls often help officers make arrests, especially for property crime. And I have to state that we've had quite a few instances where the uh, citizens of Durham have called the police department about suspicious individuals or vehicles, which resulted in arrest and uh, also recovery of property, along with uh, clearing multiple cases. Part one index crime was up 13% from the first quarter of 2013, which was a 14 year low for part one index crime. Crime was down in two parts, part one categories, which were rapes and motor vehicle thefts. The police department's first quarter clearance rates were above the 2012 FBI national average clearing rates for, our, for cities our size in all categories with the exception of aggravated assaults. We expect that clearance rate to increase as the year goes on. The average response time to priority one calls during the first quarter was 6.1 minute, which did not meet our target average of 5.8 minutes. 51.7% of priority one calls were answered in under five minutes during the first quarter. This also did not meet the target of 57%. Our sworn positions are fully staffed at this time. We currently have a basic law enforcement training academy in session with 20 Durham Police Department recruits and two recruits for other agencies. We are in the process of hiring people to fill several of the vacancies of the non-sworn positions. As we end this presentation, I'd like to share with you a few recent community events. On Friday, April 25th, police employees attended the Durham County Special Olympics event at the Durham Academy. It was a beautiful day and we enjoyed spending time with these athletes. 
Our employees also participated in the Chick-fil-A Cops on Top event on April 18th to raise money for the North Carolina Special Olympics organization. Also on Friday, this past Friday, we celebrated a successful P Police Reads program this year at the Global Scholars Academy on Dow Street and the Y.E. Smith Museum Elementary School on East Main Street. Volunteers from the police department and other law enforcement agencies read with the students and act, at, and act as man mentors. And this is a very successful program. Right now, we are participating in a program welcoming Central American leaders and law enforcement officials to Durham so that they can learn about Durham's organized gang suppression strategies and establish community partnerships. This program is part of the 2014 Central American Community Impact Exchange, a program sponsored by the U.S. Department of State, the White House National Security Staff, and the Federal Bureau of Investigation. The KC visitors also include participants from El Salvador, Guatemala, Belize, Honduras, Costa Rica, and Panama. This weekend, they rode with officers from our violent incident response team and our high enforcement abatement team. Tonight, they attended a Project Safe Neighborhoods juvenile call-in where three juveniles and their parents will be hearing messages of guidance and support from the uh, agency representatives and the youth service providers. They also will be attending several presentations of various gang and community programs, and it's an honor for Durham to have been chosen as a site for this program. And this morning, it was also noted how the main strategy that we have with our gang suppression involves not only law enforcement, but the community and also the political structure of the, uh, the city working together in order to make a difference in uh, gang suppression. And this concludes my presentation. All right. Thank you, Chief. Uh, we, we certainly want to give the police department applause when we're going in the right way. And I can just tell you, we aren't off to a good start this first quarter. I mean, with the exception of the reductions in rapes and reductions in motor vehicle thefts, uh, we just aren't off to a good start. And I, I say that to you, but I say that to the community also. Uh, we just got to find a way to do better. We, we really do. This is, this is a bad start as far as I'm concerned. Uh, our comments recognize Councilman Davis and the Mayor Pro Tem. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. I, I just wanted to ask the Chief, I was at the um, program on, at Greystone on Friday, and I think those recruits that you mentioned may have come in as a, as a unit. Was uh, that the, Yes. Um, yes. I was concerned about the, what appeared to me to be the lack of diversity among that particular group. Would that be typical of the uh, groupings that we've had recently? or? It's, it's normally not typical. Uh, we work very hard to make the academy as diverse as possible. We go to uh, great lengths in order to do so. Uh, our department is ex ex extremely diverse considering uh, the departments in uh, North sure. Carolina. Sure. Uh, it's not representative of what we want it to be, but uh, sometimes we have to deal with the, uh, the cards that are put sure. forth, and these recruits will be uh, extremely good officers. That's what we're going to strive to to serve all the uh, members or the citizens. Sure. And, and my concern their, is not the, the quality of that group. I believe that all of them are good recruits. I just want to make sure that um, perhaps in the future there can be a, a little more diversity in those recruits. Well, we're very hopeful that individuals, diverse individuals in the community uh, push to join our ranks. Sure. We are still hiring and uh, we really are looking for them to come to our door. Yeah. And at the same point in time, we're going to their door asking them to join. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Nice to Mayor Pro Tem and then Councilman Brown. That's exactly what I was going to, to mention as well. Um, do you keep um, information regarding demographics and uh, those who fail to make it through the academy and the reasons why they don't? and uh, do we look at our process to see if there are uh, parts of it or requirements that would not, um, well, I don't know how to put this. Do you look at how, at the demographics and the reasons that? Yes, we do look okay. at the reasons why. Uh, many of them just don't meet our standards for a variety of reasons that include the physical right off the bat. Uh, one of the first things that I tell anyone that I see that I am trying to enlist in the Durham Police Department is run home, start running, uh, get into shape, uh, possibly 
uh, hurts us in, in many uh, of our situations where individuals just cannot meet the physical challenge. Mm -hmm. And then after that, uh, we have to go through the background challenge, which is both uh, credit ratings, uh, criminal records, things of that nature, psychological. So they have to meet the standard that, that we provide. And we go to great lengths to try to get a diverse amount of individuals to apply uh, to come in. We bend over backwards trying to help individuals to the extent that a lot of individuals who don't make it the first time around, uh, we don't just cast them off. We ask that they continue in order to meet the standards for the second time. Um, now, are we talking about uh, the, the state standards or our, our standards are above state standards, is that Well, I'm talking about the requirements. The, the requirements that you need in order to become a police officer. Yeah. On the so. state level or Well, they have general. to meet the state level at a minimum. Okay, but I thought that we require That's We require more in the police academy. Just, they just go minute, through... Just a minute, just a minute. Yeah, they go through 300 more hours okay. at the police academy. 300 more hours. Okay, all right. Um, on the juvenile... The, diversion program. Tell me how that, that works. Well, an officer will encounter a juvenile involved in a misdemeanor offense, uh, age uh, 16, 17, and that officer would uh, make a recommendation either to the, put them into the diversion program and not cite them. Of course, he'll write the report reference to what occurred and uh, put them through the program. If the individual goes through the program and successfully completes it, then an arrest was not made because the officer won't be actually making an arrest at that point in time. So the individual will not have an arrest record. Of course, that's a one-time deal. Mm -hmm. And uh, if the individual does come in front of the officer in front of that diversion court, the charges will be brought forth. Also, if the individual doesn't complete the program, then the charges that initiated the event will be brought forth against them. Okay. Uh, remind me of the numbers that we have involved in that program. Uh, How many? How many young people have we encountered? Well, the program's just starting. It's just getting underway now. Okay, so we, we, we don't have a number. No, we don't have a number. You don't for have you. any. No. Any number. No, okay. we're still going right. through a training phase and putting the program together. Okay. Let me ask you this about the procedure. Um, who else is involved in making the decision about whether or not that young person would the be? The police officer who encounters him. Only the police yes. officer. No the, the decision has to make the officer has to make a decision at the point in time he encounters the uh, individual he's got probable cause to make a custodial arrest mm -hmm. or to write out a summons mm -hmm. and at that point that officer decides either by checking the record to see if this is a first time offense as to whether or not the individual might uh, benefit from the program okay. and we are encouraging officers to take full advantage of that program okay Councilman Brown and then <coughs> Councilman Shul. Thanks for, uh, <coughs> excuse me, the report, I guess. Uh, I want to go back to what the, the mayor articulated, and that is concerning the fact that in almost every category, the uh, crime rate is moving uh, in the wrong direction. Do you have any further insight into why this is happening, or do you see this as an aberration? Well, what? first of all, crime isn't, uh, it's not linear. It goes up and down. And uh, we're matching this uh, just a quarter off of a 14-year low that we had last time. Uh, we're, so we're, the numbers that we have today for this year competing with a 14-year low that we had last year. And also, I think the important fact is, is that the organization has identified what the problems are and are addressing them, putting the resources that are necessary, and it looks like we're moving in the right direction as far as that's concerned. Uh, could you expand on that last statement? Uh, what we're doing, we've identified the fact that uh, we've had a, a bunch of cowards shooting into cowards, yeah. shooting into occupied dwellings and uh, shooting into crowds, and our uh, our rate for assault uh, victims is not victim-based, and not incident-based, it's victim-based. So if you shoot into a house that's got maybe 10 persons inside, that's 10 victims for one incident. And uh, you don't know who you're shooting at anyway. So you could wind up injuring someone inside that house, a child, 
uh, innocent person. We've had that happen not only statewide, but also here in the city of Durham. Uh, we put together our violent incident response team. We've identified individuals who we believe were involved, who were uh, connected to both uh, the victim side and uh, the assailant side. Uh, we've been addressing him and that we've been bringing down the numbers of actual incidents uh, since then to the extent that we've minimized the incidents at this point. Thank you. Ask Councilman Shul. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Chief, thank you very much. Um, I think this is really the, since I've been on council, I think this is the first report that, uh, that, that we've seen where we had a significant jump in any of the categories, really. And so uh, just to, especially I'm, I'm looking at the aggravated assault, when you look at the part one violent crime, um, that's what really, really jumps out. And I know you've, you've talked about people shooting into crowds. Um, so when you, how do you all approach this? What, what is your strategy what is, or, or what are your tactics? What do you do now to try to get a handle on this? I, I know that um, you know, you'll be thinking about this in the way you do in CompStat and that kind of thing, but can you, can you talk more about how you are gonna try to take on this problem? Well, first of all, we're looking at the retaliatory effect of uh, the shootings they're concerned. When they involve themselves, one who shoots at a house We'll probably have someone from that house shooting at them or their house, and we're trying to identify who the players are, who are involved, what the uh, the argument may be, uh, the group, the gang, the family, and uh, and then address them, uh, going out to them using our uh, data that we have uh, through our data-led policing to identify the individuals who they're connected to, to talk to them, to get information from them, also make arrests, uh, work with probation, work with the DA's office and any other law enforcement agencies to include uh, federal agencies to come in here and address the issues in order to bring the, the violence down and send the message that it's not gonna be tolerated. And I think that the, uh, the message that this community needs to send to these individuals is to let them know that they are cowards by doing this. Do you have some sense that is this a small group of people or, I mean, do you have any sense about that at all? I, you may not. I... As far as a, a group, we've, uh, we've got quite a few individuals that we've identified. We've uh, reached out to them. We visit them on a regular basis. Uh, we have a lot of their family members who are aware that we're in touch. We've made arrests in quite a few of the cases and some of the individuals have been arrested that we know that were involved for other charges. Uh, the VIRT, as you'll see in your uh, report, uh, executive summary, uh, made quite a few arrests, one of which also uh, was involved an individual wanted for murder. So, and then also we've identified individuals who uh, had a retaliatory nature or we had information about that and they've been arrested for other crimes that they've been committing. Thank you. Um, so, yeah, I just want to reiterate the concern that my colleagues have expressed and I know you share uh, mm -hmm. and I hope we can get a handle on this and I know you all will be working hard to do so and uh, we appreciate that a lot. Um, on the, on the, um, on the misdemeanor diversion program, I was really glad to see this highlighted and I wanted to thank you and the, the, uh, the members of the police force for your embrace of this program and, and for your public support of it, Chief. I think that's very meaningful, thank you. Um, I think that uh, one of the issues in a program like this in terms of the 516 and 17 year olds who would have been eligible is the issue of getting them referred and you mentioned training I guess is the key to this and uh, do you feel like you all have the uh, the resources you need to implement this positively so we can help our young people out um, to do the training and to implement this into the future? Well the police department we do have the resources all our officers will be trained in it they're the ones who are going to be uh, making these connections uh, I'm hoping the resources are in the programs that are available to them. I think that's really where the important part comes, that these individuals that we refer uh, have the resources necessary to make the positive changes in their lives. And I think that's where we really need to focus as far as resources are concerned. So you mean after the, after the person has been referred to the misdemeanor court that they will have the, uh, the diversion court, that they will have the, uh, the resources available there? Correct, because the yeah. arrest is the easy part. 
Yeah. Everything else is where the uh, nuts and bolts of the whole program come sure. in, the pass or fail. Right, and I, I know that's important, but just thinking about it from you all's standpoint, you, you do, how, how long would it take, do you think, to train your officers to the point where they're ready to, to do this? I don't have an exact date, but I, we've been doing it for uh, quite a few months now yeah. at this point in time. Mm -hmm. But the important part is the staff that I have with me here mm -hmm. who's endured the entire uh, council meeting, and they're still sticking it out with me. Yeah. These individuals are very much dedicated to the program, yeah. well, and it's, it's that leadership that's going to make it work. Well, if they've stayed here this long, I'm sure they are dedicated, Chief. Totally dedicated. Um, and, and, I, and I believe that for a program like this to work, um, where really it involves a change in policy and a change of a way of thinking, mm -hmm. that having that leadership from the top and, and the support of the people at the top, uh, and I know that you all do, uh, is, is a great and very important, and I, I really appreciate that, and I know you'll do your best to make it work. Uh, so uh, thank you very much for that. I appreciate it. Thank you. Chief, let, let me come back to one other chart that you had in here. I just looked at it. Um, I, I'm struck by the number of offenses that have been treated in the first quarter by young people 16 to 17 and less than 16 years of age, uh, 304. But what, what it doesn't tell me is, I do know how many of these young people were involved in this. This is our your chart that says 2014, first quarter, executive summary, youth arrests 16 to 17, and juvenile petitions less than 16 for January to March of 2014, where you have a total of 304 of offenses, which ranges from aggravated assault to weapons violation and et cetera, uh, 304. But what it doesn't tell me is how many of these young people were involved. Uh, certainly not 304 young people, but I, 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 I would have to get you those numbers. I wouldn't I, have that, that would be very okay. interesting, very important, because we're on this path of trying to do disconnected youth and et cetera. Mm -hmm. And we constantly hear about, you know, a lot of the crimes are committed by a certain percentage of the population. So I really like to know how many young people were involved in these 304 offenses that were created from January to 14. We'll, we'll, we'll take a look at different, it. How many, yeah. Yeah, how many different individuals, that's, that's correct. I mean, one person could have done four or five of these different things, so how many different individuals were involved in we'll this? We'll take a look at it to get you the numbers. Thank you. And I, I like that to be a part of your regular report as we go forward. Okay. Thank you. Any, any other comments? I recognize Councilman Moffitt. Yes, I just had a question chief um, I appreciate everyone hanging in as we are through this council meeting and um, my question is on aggravated assault um, you indicated that it's uh, due to uh, um, shots being fired into crowds and uh, homes can you estimate the percentage of those aggravated assault victims that number I think the total I'm not looking at right now I think it was about 255 the percentage of those that were due to those? I would have to get back uh, I mean, to you I, in reference to the, did, uh, the did, percentage. We were talking here about 176 incidents with 254 victims. I don't want you to believe that these were all shots fired into dwellings, uh, but a, a, a large amount were, and we noticed that, especially when you're shooting into a dwelling and you could wind up with uh, five plus victims. The assaults, the aggravated assault numbers are really driven by the uh, amount of victims you could have from an incident. And uh, when you're shooting into a house or into a crowd, the incident just multiplies the amount of victims. Is there anything else, do you think there might be, is there anything else besides shots being fired into crowded areas that just might Just regular individuals this? who assault each other, uh, individuals who uh, assault people on the street who have fights, those other uh, assaults come into play. Uh, domestics are assaults. And you think all of those are up? I mean, I'm asking you just if what you all think. of them are up? I, I, I'm, yeah, I'm not, I know you don't have numbers in front of you, but asking what you... I think the totality of it, uh, to see exactly what is up, I'd have to sit back and, uh, and research it. Okay. Thank you. Well, one of the other uh, points that I have to make is the fact that our larcenies also really amount to a, a good amount of these numbers that, that make it high, the percentage, and uh, a lot of that... Uh, we're working with the communities. We're still using our RAP program to address the burglaries. Uh, we've made a lot of substantial arrests involving burglaries, involving larcenies. 
Of course, when somebody hits a parking lot and starts doing cars, now you're talking about uh, quite a few multiple incidents. And then we're still going after the, the community to start watching what they leave in their vehicles, securing their property even when they park their cars in what may appear to be the safest, uh, safest of neighborhoods to just lock their cars because you never know who's gonna come by, even a neighborhood youth uh, might take things out of the car. Same thing with uh, homes, securing them to avoid the larcenies. Where, where does simple assaults fall? I, I, I know you've got a category that says aggravated assaults, but you also have a category of simple assaults. I believe it's, uh, it's not a part one crime, it's a part two. It's, it's a part, part two. two. And you mentioned the fact that we ha had a lot of larcenies and Again, that's why I really want to understand this juvenile piece. Well, you got 80 larcenies committed by juveniles in that range that we're talking about. Well, that's also shoplifting. That's uh, breaking into cars. Uh, but it still goes in your total. Of right. You, you it know, goes so. into the total. Uh, right. It brings the numbers up. Okay. Any, any other comments? If not, uh, entertain a motion on an item to receive the report of comments. So moved. Second. It's been properly moved and second. Madam Clerk, will you open the vote? Close the vote. It passes seven to zero. Uh, are there any other items to come before the council this time? If not, council's adjourned at 9.24 p.m. Thank you.